say good morning. Man, it's so good to see all of you here today. We welcome you to Second. If you're a guest, we're glad that you're here. What a great day to be at Second. Amen? Amen. The reason I'm really excited about today is today is when we kick off our fall spiritual journey titled Limitless. And uh, I'm excited because over the next six weeks, if you're new to Second, uh, we try to do a fall spiritual journey. We try to do a spring spiritual journey. And so the goal behind that is that for several weeks, during the fall, six weeks, over the next six weeks, hopefully we as a church, as a total church, will all be on the same page together. So what it's going to look like is each week, of course, Jeremy and I are going to be preaching messages. And uh, then when you go to your small group, and you are in a small group, right? Uh, When you go to your small group, you're going to dig in a little bit deeper into what was taught on, uh, in the messages. And then uh, the, the books that we've given you have daily devotionals that just build on that each day uh, during the week. And so our hopes are that through these next several weeks together, we will really, really build up on some topics and learn about them and, and get it embedded into our hearts and in our relationship with Christ. So, with that said, I want to ask a series of questions here at the beginning. Now, these, these I do not want you to answer out loud, but I want you to consider what your response might be. I mean, I know as I ask the question in your heart and in your mind, there's going to be an answer there, I, I believe. And so, my first question is a real serious question. Uh, what are you having for lunch today? Just think about that for a minute. What are you having for lunch today? I know when I was growing up as a kid, every Sunday, it was roast, potatoes, and carrots. Amen. Can I get a witness? Amen. With gravy. And then the leftover, the leftover roast, I'll just, I wasn't even going to share this, but this is important. The leftover roast, my mom would grind up and make this roast spread that was just, it'd make you want to slap your mother-in-law. I mean... <laughs> And I didn't even have one when I was a kid, but I mean, uh, anyway. Uh, what are your plans for this evening? Maybe going to your small group. Maybe it's something else. What does next week look like for you? Do you have any big meetings? Do you have any travel plans? Are there sporting events that you're going to go to this next week? What about the rest of this month? Uh, We're already halfway through the month. What about the rest of September? What does that look like? Or what about October? How many of you are, uh, as parents of kids in schools, particularly Goose Creek, how many of you are going to take advantage of the fall break that they give us now uh, with your kids? What about November? Do you have plans for Thanksgiving? Are you going to have to travel out of town to go see family? Or is family coming to your home for Thanksgiving? And then, man, Christmas is upon us, and we have all kinds of Christmas parties and Christmas plans, and then we move into the new year, and then the summer, and my question is, what are your plans for this next summer? What vacations are you going to go on? What about next year, or the next year, or the next? How many of you know what a bucket list is? I think the majority of people do, but for those of you who may not know, a bucket list is basically a list of experiences or accomplishments that an individual might actually write down that they want to accomplish in their lifetime. There was actually a a really funny movie about a bucket list. Do you have a bucket list? And is it maybe just in your mind or have you actually sat down and written out, man, these are some accomplishments I want to do in my lifetime or uh, these are some experiences that I want to experience within my lifetime. Now, I realize that there are people in this room or maybe watching online that when we talk about uh, making lists, putting stuff down on calendars, Uh, getting it organized, there are people in this room that you get goosebumps on your arms. You know, you're just like, ooh, yeah. You know, I love that thought. And then I know that there are others in this room that are the complete opposite extreme. In other words, your life motto is, I fly by the seat of my pants, you know. 
If something sounds good, I do it. If I want to go somewhere, I may jump up and go. And then there are a few people that kind of fall in between those two. Jeremy said last week in his message uh, this phrase, time is, do you remember? Money. Time is money. But I would like to add that, yes, that is a true statement. Time is money. But I would also like to declare or share with you today that I believe time is is priceless it's priceless we don't like to think about time really I mean we just tend to live life but the reality is we only have 24 hours in a day we only have seven days in a week we only have four weeks in a month and 12 months in a year and how often do we find ourselves saying man where did the time go Or how often do we find ourselves saying, oh my, how time has flown by. The psalmist writes in Psalm 90, verse 12, he says this, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. In other words, The psalmist is trying to help us understand the reality that our time on earth is not limitless. But there is one thing that is limitless, and it's called eternity. Eternity. My challenge for you today, hopefully, by the end of this message, is that you will hopefully do this one thing, and that is that you would start thinking with eternity in mind. That you would start thinking with eternity in mind. Now, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, would you take them out and turn to the book of James? The book of James. It's towards the end of the uh, New Testament. We're going to be in chapter 4. And while you're turning there, I want to kind of give you a visual of where I'm going today. And I want to use a a physical illustration that is not original to me. In fact, probably uh, the most famous person that has used this illustration in the past is a a guy named Francis Chan. He's an author, he's a pastor, missionary, super guy. But Francis Chan uses this illustration where he has a rope. And if you would just imagine with me for a moment that this rope represents eternity. Eternity. In other words, you kind of see this end of it, but you don't see an end there. Let's just, for illustration purposes, let's just assume that this rope just continues on down the aisle, out the door, and it just wraps around the earth hundreds, thousands, millions of times. That is a picture of what eternity is like. There is no measurement to it. It just goes on and on and on. Now what's interesting is, at the beginning of this rope, I purposely put about two inches, roughly, of red tape. And what this two inches of red tape represents is our time on earth, our lives. For most part, Most of us spend our whole life only thinking about this. It's all we think about. I can tell you personally, as a kid growing up, uh, of course, you know, I'm so old, uh, you know, there there weren't the computer games and the, the gaming systems that are out there now. So as a kid, when I was growing up, I used to live for the weekends. I used to live for the fact that I didn't have to be in school and I could go home and I would ride my bike and I I had a skateboard and I had friends in our our neighborhood. We had a a horseshoe-shaped street and at the end was uh, what we thought at that time was this massive, massive round piece of grass. It was maybe 50 feet across, but we'd go out there and we'd play baseball. I lived, honestly, I lived for the weekends because I loved going to church. I realize that's kind of weird uh, I was a PK, I was a preacher's kid, but all my friends were at church. We, we did life together, and I, I lived for those experiences. But I also realized that as I grew, 
as my life continued to move up this, this little piece of red, I got into, as a teenager, you know, all the things teenagers want to do, man, I wanted to get a driver's license. That was a big deal. And I'll never forget, man, the first time I got my driver's license and my parents let me drive their lime green Ford LTD with a white vinyl top to school. And I thought I was the man. Most kids nowadays wouldn't even touch a car like that. Man, I dreamed of getting a job and making some money, maybe actually having a girlfriend, although that wasn't very often at all. Then I remember growing up thinking, man, I want to I go to college and I want to graduate from college. And I, I, I felt called to ministry. I remember thinking, man, I just want to find a church that w- might hire me, that I could serve at and that I could give my life to that. And then I, I hope I could find someone to marry and to spend a life with and to have children with and to get more children. And um, <laughs> back then I used to dream about retirement. Now I know that's, uh, that's a faded dream, lost, <laughs> lost dream. Counselors helping me with that. <laughs> but for most of us, we, we live this little piece of red tape. It's all we think about. It's all we dream. It's, it's everything about us. And as we edge towards the end of this red tape, there's a point in time where many of you in this room, you, you live for this time where you've saved and you've worked and you've worked and you've saved and you go, now I no longer have to work. I can retire. I'm going to travel and have so much fun in that little bitty piece. And what's really sad, if you really think about it, if you think about that little bitty bit in comparison to the rest of our life, it's, it's such a small part. But then, we die. We don't like to think about that. But the truth is, we do. And then, it's eternity. All this, all this is now gone. And all we have for the rest of eternity is this. James writes... In James chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Now, James is warning his readers in James chapter 4, really the whole chapter. James is warning his readers about their relationship with the world. And that his readers needed to be very careful not to be caught up in what the world was all about. And he said... He even says at the beginning, he says, you know, what, you know what causes quarrels and fights among you? It's because of your passions, the things that you want. He says, he says you, you want certain things and you don't get them, and so you covet and you fight. Or he goes on to say, and he says, you know, you, you ask for things and you don't get them, and you get angry about it, but the reason you don't get them is you didn't ask with the right intent. It was all about you and your passions and what you wanted. And then he talks about this idea of submitting to God with our lives, not to the world, but to God with our lives, that we would live our lives in such a way that would solely bring glory to God, not to ourselves. But what we just read, if you think about it, 
is really pretty heavy. Here we are making plans. Here we are filling our schedules. Here we are booking our trips and planning on retirement. And then James says, you don't even know what tomorrow holds. Talk about a reality check. And what's even harder, (laughs) kind of a punch in the face, is when James says, what is your life? What is your life? And then he says, it's a mist. It's only here for a little bit of time, and then it's gone. Now, before you're, you know, starting to get uptight with me, thinking that I'm telling you it's wrong for making plans or that it's wrong to uh, even plan for retirement and have trips and all that. It, that's not what I'm trying to communicate at all. But here's the question I would propose to you, and it's this. How often do you think beyond now? How often do you get past the red tape, and think beyond what it is for us even right now. In other words, how often do you think about eternity? Eternity. What's interesting to me is that God created man to live forever. I don't know if you knew that. But God, at the very beginning of time... He created man for eternity. And in fact, Ecclesiastes tells us that God put eternity into the heart of man. But because Adam and Eve sinned, their sin brought death. It brought death. God's desire was that they would dwell with him in this perfect place in this perfect garden and have perfect relationship and communication. They would serve him and he would walk with them and and fellowship with them. But sin separated them and us from God and brought death. In fact, one of my, honestly, uh, from our days when as a staff we were memorizing Ephesians, one of my favorite passages is Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, and I want to read it for you. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, get this, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. And here's where it gets good. But God. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which with he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. You see, in our spirit, we are made alive again because of the blood of Jesus Christ and our belief in him. That's why scripture tells us that God loved us so much that he gave. He gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever would believe in him would not perish, but get this, would have what? Everlasting life. Eternity. It was was with eternity in mind that God gave to us. And so really, as believers, our goal, this is hard, but as believers, our goal is not this life. But eternity should be all about our life. In our time with God. So I want to ask again, how often do you think beyond now? Beyond now. 
Why? Because I believe with all my heart, changing your mind to thinking about eternity has massive and enormous implications. Now hang with me because I'm, I'm going to kind of sound a little bit like a Debbie Downer for just a moment, okay? But just a week or not last week, the week before, I p- performed a funeral service for one of our longtime members. Many of you would not have known him. He had been out because of health issues. And as a pastor, of course, I have walked with far too many people far too many families who have lost loved ones. And I've walked with them as they've dealt with the death of a family member or a loved one. Some were very unexpected. Some were very tragic circumstances. And some were, just to be honest, expected because of old age or a health reason. But I can tell you this. Every time I do a funeral service... It always makes me think about death. This is where it's going to sound like Debbie Downer. I think about my death. But I also think about eternity. I think about, you know, we uh, a moment ago were singing a song, Holy, Holy, Holy is Your Name. And I think about eternity from the standpoint of someone like my dad who passed away 27 years ago. And my dad was so looking forward to heaven. And I I think about in those moments and even in the moments of death that I deal with, I think about my dad and I think about the reality that my dad for 27 years has spent time singing at the top of his lungs, holy, holy, holy. And yet for him... I'm sure it only seems like a moment. For the most part, we all find ourselves making plans for the here and the now. But my challenge to you today is that you would begin thinking with eternity in mind. For many reasons, but I want to be very practical this morning. And I want, I want you to start trying to wrap your mind around this idea of thinking with eternity in mind. First of all, first of all, if we're going to be thinking with eternity in mind, it ought to motivate us to consider our relationship with Jesus. If we're going to be thinking with eternity in mind, it ought to motivate us to consider our relationship with Jesus. Can I ask everyone in the room a question this morning? And even those that are watching online. Has there ever been a moment in your life that you actually put your faith and trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord? Has there ever been that moment? Have you ever personally made that decision to be a follower of Jesus? Remember, when sin entered, death happened. Death happened. And because of sin, we have to understand that in eternity, according to Scripture, there's only two potential places. One is to be with God in heaven, and the other is to be separated from God in a place that we call hell. Because God is holy, and because we are born sinners, we have to reconcile our lives in accordance to the truth that we know about Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came so that through his death, right? His death on the cross paid the debt 
that we owe as a result of our sin. Jesus paid the debt so that we wouldn't have to pay it anymore. We don't, we don't have to spiritually die and be separated from God if we believe and trust in Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. So I just want to ask, has there ever been that time? Has there ever been that moment where you understood this, this idea of Jesus coming and dying on a cross for, for your sin and mine, for everyone's sin? Has there ever been that moment where, you know, in the, that you just said, yes, I believe that and I want that for my life. I want to receive that in my life. Has, there, has that ever happened? And if it hasn't, if it hasn't, we would love to talk to you about that. We would love to sit down and answer any and all questions that you might have, anything that you might be struggling with in this idea of surrendering to Jesus, in this idea of becoming a follower. We would love to sit down and chat about it. Because our desire, more than anything in this world, is that everyone, everyone in the world would know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Do you know him? Do you know him? Because trust me, knowing Jesus impacts this in a far better way, bigger way than you realize. So the second part of this thought process, though, if you think about thinking with eternity in mind and causing us to evaluate or uh, look at and if it would motivate us in our relationship with Christ, and that is, if you are a believer, maybe this morning you would say, yes, Tommy, I did that when I was a child or I did that when I was a teenager. I believed in Jesus. I, I I surrendered my life to him. Maybe you were an adult. Maybe it wasn't too long ago. Maybe you're new at this. But you say, yes, I believe that I'm a follower of Christ. Then my next question would be, with eternity in mind, is how are you growing in that relationship? How are you growing in that relationship? Are you understanding more and more about who Jesus is and what he has done for you? Are you uh, understanding more and more about the plans that he has for you and how he wants you to manage your life in relationship to the fact that now you're a follower? I guess I would put it this way. How is your relationship with Jesus transforming your daily thought processes? How is your relationship with Jesus transforming your daily thought processes? Remember, if you go back to James, James chapter 4, what we read a moment ago, verse 15, he said this, he says, instead, in other words, instead of thinking you can go out and make plans and do all this and because you don't know what tomorrow may bring, your life is a mist. He said, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will, do, we, we will live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. Do you see it? Do you see it? it he's saying what you need to do is that you need to develop a transforming mind process on a day-by-day -day basis of saying, Lord, how do you want me to live my life today? How do you want me to use my knowledge of who Jesus is to transform the way I live each and every day? Because, again, sorry, camera guys, throwing you for a loop. Because, again, what we're living is this. And the question is, how do we live this with God's glory in mind instead of our own glory? When you think about that, in other words, when you think about saying, so God, how, how do I do it? What do you want from me today? That ought to change 
how you see your earthly relationships. It ought to change how you, if you're married, how you handle your married life. It ought to change if you are a parent or a grandparent, how you relate to those kids and children. You ought to, it ought to cause you to consider your relationships with those who live by you, the, the people that God put in your next door yard or back, back neighbor yard. It ought to cause you to think about the relationships that God has brought you into within your workplace or your kids' sporting events or whatever it may be. There is a purpose that God has put you in in each one of those relationships for you to bring the glory of God into that situation. For you to be able to share your faith and what Jesus has done for you to, to someone who might be in desperate need of that information. If you think about it, if we pause each day and we say, Lord, how, how do you will for me to live today? It, it might change our daily schedules. It might cause us to give some things up that we really shouldn't be doing or going places we really shouldn't be going. It might cause us to think about how we can give our time to more Christ-honoring things or, or be involved in ways that would bring people into the kingdom more and more. If you think about it, when you stop and pause on a daily basis and say, Lord, how do you will for me to live my life in glory to you today? It might change the way you think about your money and how you might be able to leverage your money for more kingdom thought process things as opposed to self-centered things. I want to close with this thought. I believe that one of the greatest challenges with having a thought process thinking towards eternity is understanding that there is only one commodity that you can bring to heaven. One commodity. People. Uh, you know, you've heard it before. There's no U-Haul behind a hearse. You can't take anything with you from this life. But if there's one thing that you can take with you is a spouse who maybe doesn't believe yet but needs to. A child who maybe has never professed their faith in Christ, but you can direct them and grow them in that direction an extended family member or a co-worker, a neighbor or a friend. See, we will not take all the stuff that we accumulate in this lifetime, in that two-inch span of our life. It's a mist. But there will be people that need to know Jesus, that your relationship with them and your communication with them could dramatically impact their eternity. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for today. I thank you for uh, your word and how it challenges us. Lord, I, I realize uh, thinking about eternity is not something that we do on a regular basis. And I realize that that's, uh, you know, kind of an odd thing. But Lord, I, I pray today that as we leave this place, maybe, if, if only for a moment, maybe a few days, maybe a week or so, we might consider the challenge of James. That our life on this earth, the thing that we give so much time and energy and everything into is just a brief time and then it's eternity. Lord, teach us to number our days that we can gain a heart of wisdom. Would you stand and let's worship.